npm uh, to install modules. Following that, we'll do some, uh, we'll do the Twitter auth, but we'll take it further. I'll show you the user ID and user level and how you can filter data coming back to the client to only be for that user. And I'll also show you how to cache credentials so you don't have to hit login every time. After that, we'll do some spatial stuff. So um, geolocation, finding out where you are, showing that on a map, uh, adding places to the map, then performing radial searches to pull back points of interest within a particular radius. And then I think we do uh, peri periodic versus push notifications. So periodic is another type. So I'll show you both of those and all the new tooling in VS 2013 to make it super easy. Um, and then blob SAS, uploading images and such to Windows Azure. Um, and then I think, I think that's it. Hopefully I'll remember when we're, when we're going through this. I think we've got like a minute or so. How long do we have? All right. Everyone going to Dreamworld tonight? Oh, is that tomorrow? Someone told me it was tonight. <laughs> Someone told me it was tonight, so no, that's funny. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> All right. You should come in and watch this session. <laughs> We've got to fill this room up. All right. I think what we'll do is we'll get started because uh, this is... This is a hard session to give. Um, this, this session has only a few slides um, because we're going to code most of the session away. And as you can see, uh, the slides are basically just a, a reminder for me, but also tell you the sort of scenarios we're going to build. Um, so fingers crossed, there won't be lots of mistakes. There'll probably be a couple small ones. It's hard to, hard to stand up and code stuff for an hour, but uh, it should be good. So let's get started here. This session is developing Windows 8.1 apps uh, with Windows Azure Mobile Services. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and point out some of the things that are new with Windows 8.1, as well as new tooling in VS 2013 Preview that we recently released at Build as it applies to mobile services. So for those of you who are in the, uh, our last session, the overview session for mobile services, we did a lot of coding in the portal. In this session, we're going to do a lot of it in Visual Studio. Um, so we've got a really good tooling experience uh, coming together there. So let's look at the agenda. So we'll start with getting started. So are those people who haven't seen, who, who has seen mobile services here? OK. So OK, we do need, we'll do getting started. I'll show you how to enable source control and how to use NPM. Uh, this is really important for sort of team-based scenarios where you may want to start editing your scripts and uh, commit that back up to your mobile service without doing sort of the, the portal workflow, which basically means you're editing scripts live and hitting save. So source control much better for team scenarios. Um, auth, uh, we'll deal, I'll show you Twitter auth, but I'll take it further than the last session and show you how you can actually filter result sets um, or filter your data sets being returned to the client to the authenticated user. So you know, if I have some data in there, you have some data in there, basically it's just going to return back my data. Uh, we'll look at credential caching so you, don't have to, um, so you don't have to hit authorize every time uh, the login is shown. So that'll disappear with that. Geolocation, answer key questions, where am I, what's near me, and uh, where am I, what's near me, yeah. so. Geolocator class there, a few small changes in Win 8.1 for that API. Uh, so we'll cover that off and put it on Bing Maps, make it look sort of pretty. Media, how do you upload data or any binary data really? Uh, but in this case, we're going to do images. How do you upload that to Windows Azure um, securely? And last, notifications and live tiles. So this one I'll cover periodic notifications versus push notifications. They're two different ways of delivering, say, tile updates. Um, and depending on your application scenario, one is significantly easier than the other one. And we've got a whole bunch of uh, new tooling for 
for configuring your notification workflow. In actual fact, it only takes about one minute to do the new tooling. So some really cool stuff there. So uh, let's get started. Let's uh, do the getting started on mobile services. Uh, this is a level 300 session, which is why there's lots of code. Um, let's do this. So I'm going to start in the portal here. Um, I'm going to create a service. And we perhaps we call it, uh, what do you guys want to call it? And you know, it's got to be better than the last session's name, right? One of my friends threw his name out there. OK, you, sir, in the green shirt, what's your name? Pa pardon? Peter? OK, we're going to call this service Peter. Um, so it's available. Um, I'm going to keep it now. No, so basically, this is a subdomain for your mobile service. Uh, it's that public endpoint that your clients call into to do things like you know, deal with data, uh, right, so, uh, deal with data, all your CRUD operations, call custom API, log in, and such. The next option there is, you know, what DB do we want to store that in? In this case, we're going to store it in a uh, SQL database instance, a new SQL database instance. You can use the free option here if you uh, are going to have data sets less than 20 meg. I just like to do this because I like to have my boss charge more money, and it makes it look like I'm working a lot more than, than sometimes I do. <laughs> so region, uh, that's the region where you want this web tier to be located. We're going to select East Asia. So that's our web tier. Now, that web tier stores data within a database. And here we can go and configure uh, where that database will be. So typically, you don't want your web tier you know, in East US and your uh, data tier in, say, East Asia because that would essentially mean there's this big, long uh, latency between the two. And we, we notify you if that's the case, but uh, as you see up there. So I'm going to put this in East Asia. Um, we need to provide a server login. For those of you that uh, are not familiar with mobile services, I'd recommend you watch the overview session recording, uh, which was a session we just gave there. Uh, I'll give more context, because this is more of a deep dive. But what's happening right now is we're spinning up that service. Uh, it's going and deploying the DB, going and deploying the REST endpoint that we can go and call into. Um, and what we'll do once this is created, uh, we'll do the quick start. We'll create a to-do item uh, table, but then we'll go and switch and use source control to start applying changes to this server-side script. And we'll pull in some custom node modules. And I'll show you how you can use that. Um, so node, the node modules, which you can pull into mobile services, when this is sort of deployed, there's, there's a list of, say, 20 or 30 node modules that are available to you. If you want to start using third-party node modules, sort of similar to NuGet, for those people that are familiar with NuGet, it's like just an extensibility mechanism to bring in someone's library. Um, these node modules, we can actually pull in and utilize them. So if you wanted to, say, send tweets with Twitter, there'll be a node module for Twitter out there. If you want to do some kind of crypto or something like that, there's that there. Image manipulation, all sorts of things. Uh, but what we'll do here now is we'll start with Peter, and we will download the Quick Start Windows Store app. Now, you need three things for this to work. One, Visual Studio. Two, a table. Um, and then we need to download this uh, basically zip of a pre-set up solution that can talk to our mobile service that demonstrates a, a to-do scenario. So we've downloaded it. Let's extract it. So just so people that uh, weren't in the last session have sort of some context of what this is, we'll do this. I'll spin it up so you can see it. We won't walk through the source code because uh, it's sort of expected. You probably know that by now for the deep dive session. So this is spinning up the application. It's already set up to reference the mobile services client SDK. It's just a simple NuGet package. And this provides a, a, essentially a to-do list. So we can say, uh, don't go to dream world tonight. Probably not a good idea. We'll say go tomorrow. So that's actually executing CRUD operations against our service and storing that data directly within our mobile service. If I flip back here, you'll see in the data tab that we've got a to-do item table, and we've also got two records here. So by clicking in, you can see 
that there is uh, my data. So let me zoom in a little. Oh, it's already 125. Can everyone up the back sort of see that? OK. So there, there's our data. Now, the code on the client side is really straightforward. Simple reference to Windows Azure, excuse me, mobile services. You can see that that's a NuGet package called Windows Azure Mobile Services. That's the dependencies. To talk to our mobile service, we've got a mobile service client instance here in our app code behind. And to perform our CRUD operations, it's simply going, and this is our entity that's serialized over the wire. We get a reference to a table, and then we can perform insert, update, and delete operations with one simple line of code. Now, what I'd like to show you is how we can start editing server-side scripts, not in the portal, such as here, but within our local uh, developer machine using an IDE of your choice. Um, so what we're going to do is I'll just show for the people that weren't here, server-side script is essentially business logic that runs on the server side as you're performing operations against your service. Um, so you can go in and do things like, say, uh, item dot, uh, created date is equal to new date. And that'll go and add a created date property uh, to our mobile service and scaffold that within the DB. But in a team environment, you don't really want like three or four developers coming in and arbitrarily modifying scripts. What if they you know, both want to edit this? It's not going to turn out in, the, in a sort of very easily used scenario. So everyone here knows what source control is, right? Good, okay. <laughs> Except for Glav up the back there that just walked in. Um, so let's go and enable source control on this. Just to close out that scenario, this should have a date now. So you'll see that in the portal. And this is, as we, we recently went through, called dynamic schematization. It's added a date column, and you can see the date there in UTC form. So let's go and enable source control. Go back to the dashboard and come down. There'll be a setup source control option here. So when I hit yes on this, it's going to go and create essentially a Git repo that I can clone down to my local developer machine and edit all those scripts, whether it's your you know, CRUD operation table scripts on your inserts and updates or whatnot, whether it's your custom API, which we'll go through later today as well, uh, scheduler, uh, shared scripts, and a number of different things. This normally takes about a minute. Any questions? Uh, it's hosted up in Azure, so it's part of our infrastructure. Yeah. So that's done. And it's flipped me across to my configure tab. So if you're ever looking for these, you can actually come up here and get it. So there's my URL to clone from. And if I go to git shell, there we go. And we'll go C dev Peter, and then uh, I'm just going to uh, make a directory and call it services. No, we'll call it foo. Nice naming convention. It's like Glav's code. I used to work with him. And then we git clone, drop in the URL, hit enter. Now that's going to pull down all of the source for that mobile service if I can remember my password and credential. Um, so you only have to set up your credential one time uh, for mobile services. And after that, it applies to all of your repos. So uh, that's name. And of course, it supports multiple users going against that one repo for your team scenario. I think I got that right. There it goes. So that's pulled it down. So uh, if we go into Peter now, see that it's picked up that it's a repo here. And I can say, uh, I think tree-f. Let's have a look here. So you can see that this is a pretty much a stock standard mobile service. We've got, uh, we've got service, API is where your custom API script will be if you've got them. Um, scheduler is your scheduled script. Shared is if you want to add your own shared code that's you know, reusable from multiple separate scripts or custom APIs or whatnot, rather than you know, repeating and, and copying and pasting that code in. Um, table here. We've only got one table, and there's the uh, insert script.js. 
and we've also got todoitem.json. Now, todoitem.json is uh, basically your permissions, service, table, let me get out of this here, sorry. There we go. Where is it? It's our notepad, notepad service. Oh man, I can't type today. Uh, okay, service, and then it was table, backslash t, to do item. There we go. So there's your permissions, and by default, you can see that for each of the CRUD operations, we require an application key. That's the default out of the box. Um, you can obviously change all of this in the portal, but that's not the point of this demo. Let's, uh, let's do something like uh, pull in a custom node module and utilize that within our server-side script. So this is a really great way to complement the existing node modules to allow you to go and build out scenarios that aren't sort of available out of the box. So let's uh, go here. I'm going to show you the node module we're going to use. Uh, this is basically a module that generates unique IDs or GUIDs. Um, so not easy to do in JS. So this basically provides us an API for it. So you can go and search through all the, uh, all the available modules here on node or npmjs.org. And if we come down, you'll see that all of them provide a little bit of documentation that shows you how to get started. So we basically need to install this and then we can call uh, require that node module now, and then we can call a property here, or a method or function, I should say, that's going to return back good. So uh, let's let's grab that. I am in the right directory. So let's say npm install node uid. So that's going to go off and now grab all of that content. Uh, and let's say tree whack. I think I've dropped it in the wrong folder. Yeah, it should be in the service, sorry. Let's uh, grab that in again, because my command line skills are not that great, but there we go. So that's now pulled that in and put it in the right place within the tree. Where did it go? Did I get an error there? Service, CD service. Okay. Gone and dropped it directly there, that's weird. Okay, not to worry. In any case, that must be the right place. As you can tell, I'm not always dealing with Node so much, but let's, uh, let's open now the service table to item insert JS. So now you can edit in whatever you'd like, um, and we can do things like item.version is equal to Let's uh, require in that module the d is equal to require, and then we say node uuid, I think is the exported package name. So uuid.v1. V1, and that's the right package name, right. So we save this now. Then we say git add. Okay. Then git push. Uh, sorry, git commit dash m. Say add a module. And then we say git push. That's going to go off and push our uh, change script and that node module up to my mobile service and deploy that live. So if we flip back to the portal now, and refresh, you'll see that we've now essentially edited locally and committed this change via source control. There we go. So there's my changes. So that's that's pretty cool experience, right? So if you prefer write node in like Sublime or something like that, you can you can use that. But we do have support in Visual Studio, and that's something that we'll, uh, we'll show you shortly. So this session is like around what are the things that people really start hitting after they sort of kick the tires with mobile services. You know, you go out, you build something, you're storing data, you've got the easy auth flow, but a lot of people come back and say, well, I've got this now, but there's, there's things that, you know, 
the simple one line of code sort of demo isn't practical for in a real world application. Um, so in the auth scenario, people want to authenticate users using mobile services, but then they may want to return data back for only the authenticated user. That's sort of simple to do, we'll do that. The thing that typically is asked on the, the auth scenario is how do I cache my credentials? I don't want my user to you know, hit authorize or log in every single time they run the application. I just want it to happen in the background, cache that credential in and sort of let them proceed. So what we'll do here is we'll build out the auth scenario, we'll filter some data coming back to the client, and then I'll show you how to cache credentials for that user. So let's, uh, I've opened this in the wrong uh, instance of VS. But let's uh, jump in here, go over to identity. Let's configure our auth scenario. We did this in the last session, but we'll take it that few steps further. Uh, go to my apps. So this is the Twitter API. And to configure an auth flow for, in this case, Twitter it being our identity provider, uh, we just need to create a simple application. So we'll call this Peter and Peter's app. Uh, Nick, and now importantly, the callback URL, which is used when the identity provider redirects after a successful auth. What's going on down here? I've got some interwebs issues. It's not good. Control. Yeah, okay. Hopefully it comes back. There we go. Okay. So, callback URL in this case is HTTPS peter.azure-mobile.net. So that's our mobile service. Agree. Read the text normally. CDO1342. Hit create Twitter app. Okay, well, that's probably makes sense that someone's already got the app called Peter. Um, all right, scroll down. Now, two credentials is all we need for our mobile service here in this case. So I select Peter, I go to my identity tab, and you can see if we're configuring other identity providers, you just paste the credentials for them. Doing Twitter, let's drop this guy in, hit save. Now that's basically enabled our mobile service to authenticate against Twitter but we need to restrict access to our particular table. So if I want to say I only want authenticated users to be able to query from this to-do item table, essentially what I do is I come down and say only authenticated users can perform insert, update, delete, or read. Now it's granular such that you can, you know, if you want read to be everyone, that's okay. For this scenario, we'll just do authenticated users and we'll save that. Now, what I'd like to show you is some of the VS 2013 uh, enhancements we've made here. So from here on in, we probably won't need to use uh, the portal anymore or Notepad to go and edit those scripts. We can do it right within VS. So this isn't available in 2012. It's sort of new for 2013. So let's uh, open that project up. I think it was this one. Hit OK. Now this is saying the downloaded template was Windows 8. Do you want to upgrade to 8.1? Yes, I do. So that'll upgrade it to an 8.1 app for me. Did I hit OK on that? Still, let me. That's uh, what went wrong there. Open with 2013. I must have hit the wrong button in the dialog there. Nope, it's not updating. Ah, oh, that's right. What am I doing? Properties, Windows 8.1, retarget, hit OK. Now it's turned it into an 8.1 app. OK, so that's done. Now, what about editing those scripts on the server side? So under Windows Azure, installing a Windows Azure SDK now gives you a Windows Azure node. You can see here that I've got mobile services under that as well. So. This will go off and list each and every one of my mobile services. I can select Peter, and under this node, we'll see all of our tables and all of our scripts. 
And then from right within VS here, we can actually go off and start editing uh, those scripts. So I select insert, and perhaps I don't want this. Uh, what we'd want to do here is we want to track the user ID, user.user .user ID. So we're going to attach a user ID property, and we're going to say item.level is equal to user.level. So this will actually return back the authenticated user's identity. Um, in this case, it'll be Twitter, and it'll be just a bunch of numbers. But by editing that and now saving it, that's gone and published that live up to my mobile service in the portal. Uh, I don't have to go and deal with logging to the portal or whatnot. So that's that. What about reading data back? So perhaps I only want data for the authenticated user to be returned back to this particular uh, client app. And we can do that uh, with the read script here. So in this case, I can extend the read query and say where the user ID property is the same current user.user .user ID. So that's going to query saying, give me everything in the to do item table where the user ID is equal to the currently authenticated user. So hit save on this guy. And then we can run our application. And what we'll see here, I'll add an item. What did I do? Uh, sorry, forgot the auth code. That's basically a, an unauthorized error. So what I, <laughs> what I need to do here is authenticate the user because we changed the permissions. So that's pretty easy to do. Say a sync. Say a wait. App.mobileService.getTable. Say to do item. And then we say, insert a, oh, sorry, log, why am I getting the table? We're authenticating here. <laughs> it's late. There we go. So we're going to log in with Twitter. Good. Hit run. Now what we should be able to do is log in. Now this is the wrapped web authentication broker. So web authentication broker is basically a class that you can use to uh, provide that specific UI that you saw for logging in. What we've done with mobile services is we've wrapped it and turned about 30 or 40 lines of code you'd need there into the one line of login code which you saw. But now when I add items, I'm authenticated, and if we switch back to the portal, you'll see that we're now tracking the individual users, user ID and level. So we can see that these other items here, when they were inserted, there was no auth on the app. This last item, which we just inserted then, you can see my Twitter ID, and the level here is set to authenticated. So when I come back and hit refresh, which is essentially querying the service, it's only returning back my data. I'm not getting those other records. So it's, it's quite straightforward to implement, um, but it's certainly sort of one of the questions we get asked. The more common one, though, that comes up now is if I go back to that application, and I say, hit this again. See how we're getting the same dialog? Um, it's cached my uh, username and password, but from an application uh, end user, sort of user experience perspective, I still have to hit authorize. So we can cache credentials here, and the mobile services client SDK is built out to make that sort of reasonably easy to do. So let's, let's do that. So what I'm going to use is actually uh, a little bit of code here, which I prepared earlier. And what, it, what we're going to use is what's called the password vault. Um, now, the password vault is essentially uh, a, a, a key value pair store that obviously encrypts that data. And it'll actually sync anything that you've put into the password vault across multiple of your devices. So if I am storing my credentials here in Password Vault on this machine, they will actually roam to my other machine where I'm logged in with the same live ID. So caching the credential here into Password Vault out of the box is going to allow me to not have to log in on you know, my other device when I run this application. So it's a sort of cool feature, and it's quite easy, quite easy to do. So let me uh, 
grab some uh, scaffolded code that I've got here, that storage, uh, auth, credential locker. So because of trademark issues with the password vault name, we actually, I'm calling this credential locker. But uh, what we can do is say var vault is equal to new password vault. You can see that this is within or comes from the WinRT API, Windows Security Credentials, and we just create a password vault like that. Now, to add a credential to it, we say vault, add. We pass in a new password credential. And here, we provide the resource. We're just going to call that mobile service, as defined up here. Username and password. So now that we have that, we of course need to call it when the user is authenticated, right? So what we can say here is we can say if the app.mobile service current user is null, then we want to authenticate. And then once authenticated, should be a little bit of extra logic here to make sure that you successfully authenticated. It'll throw an exception if you didn't. Um, but what we'll do is we'll consider that you know we've written all that, and we'll just go off and cache this credential. So I can now say credential locker. Credential locker. Dot add credential. That's the method we just built. And then we can say app.mobileservice.currentuser.userID. App.mobileservice.currentuser.mobileservice authentication token. So after you successfully authenticate against a mobile service using whichever identity provider you want, we send back a, a, basically a credential or an authentication token that you can use to keep requesting uh, and hitting your mobile service without having to go out and uh, basically do the auth flow again. Now in this case, we're going to cache it. So that's part of it done. We're now storing it. It's going in the password vault. But how do we actually retrieve that from the cache? It's quite straightforward. Uh, the code that I've got here already does that. Um, so you can see get credential. Uh, basically, we're going to store the credential when we get it here, new up the password vault, find by resource name, and then to get the password, it's a little bit odd. You'd expect that this would actually return the password, but you actually have to do a second retrieve operation to get that password back. And then I just return the credential. So what we can do now is we can use that to see when the app starts, do we have a credential in the password vault? If we do, grab it and then set our mobile service client, user ID and authentication token to those credentials and that will then bypass the need to log in. So we can do that in on launched here. I'm going to use a snippet to try and uh, get back some time. And you can see credential locker, get credentials, so that uses password vault under the hood. If it's not null, we simply set our mobile service current user to the credentials username, new that up, and then we set the mobile service authentication token to the password returned. And with that, we now have the essentially the, the credential pulled in. So that has so what's happened here, I think, is when I practice this demo, we've probably got uh, that password cached in the password vault already. So let me just do if it's null, then show it. Yeah. So what we can do is we can say credential. And you'll see here, there's the credential named mobile services. That's cached from my last demo. Let's close that. Let's run this again. You'll see, so the first time we hit this now, it asks us for our credential. Good. Close the app. And come down and run this guy. And this time, you'll see that it's just pulled the credential directly from the password vault. And we can now go and sort of perform our operations without having to authenticate. So a really useful tip. What makes it really awesome is that it, that's synced across your devices as well. So you only really have to log in once on this device. That token will expire. 
So you should add basically code there that handles an invalid request against your mobile service. And if it's an unauthenticated uh, exception, well then you just have the user log in again and you, you basically then store the credential in the password vault again. So a little bit of handling that you have to do around this scenario, but that's like the, the, the core pieces of code that you need to know to be able to cache that credential. So next one is, this one's a big one, uh, geolocation. So there's a lots of apps in store that basically uh, work with spatial data. So, you know, latitude, longitude, altitude, and that kind of thing. The common questions for this, these scenarios is like, how do I find out where am I? Um, how do I save a place that's of interest to me? And how can I search for places that are nearby me? And what I'd like to do here is show you how you can build out an application on Windows 8 to basically uh, find your current location, save points of interest up against a mobile service that you've uh, sort of specified on a map, and then query back any places within a radius. It's called a, a radial search. Um, so let's do that one. So I think I just hit add the source control. Yep, not to worry. I've got a pre-partially built solution here. And what we'll do is we'll create a mobile service for that. So again, we no longer need to go to the portal with this. We can create a service here. Say so we'll call this Geo Demo Peter. It's checking, that's valid. We'll drop it in East Asia. We'll create a new DB. Uh, my server username is DBA. Get this right. We'll create that. So what we're doing here is I'm going to create a mobile service that's going to store those points of interest. And then we'll create what's called a custom API. It's a new feature we recently released, which allows you to execute script on the server side without having to tie that script to a CRUD operation. Um, so once this is done, we should be good to go. While we wait for that, modal dialogue, we will take some questions. Any questions? Yep. Ah, yes. So that's the thing. So the source control scenario I showed you at the start, that is actually using Git repos, and you are cloning it and editing it locally. The server explorer experience is actually editing directly. It's not tied into that sort of cloning experience. So that this is preview of 2013. Um, <laughs> failed to create mobile service. It, this is preview in 2013, and I, I, I do agree with you. Like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to say file new mobile service project and then have that use you know, a Git repo and commit that back? That's something that we're sort of hearing some people say, and you know, we've got a user voice forum. If you search for user voice mobile services, go in there and vote on that, and then that's a scenario that we'll look at sort of building out. The reason that we didn't do that to start with is that We've got more than just .NET devs that we're looking after here. We also provide this for iOS and Android devs. So we need to balance our investment in tooling. You know, we could go and add the feature to have a file new project mobile service here. But what you would uh, be doing there is basically taking away a feature or the time that could be spent on a feature that would be something that all device platforms could utilize. So we prioritize based on feedback from users. So if it's something you really want, vote on it, and then it'll bubble up the stack. Uh, so let's have a look what happened here. Da, 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 da. Unhealthy super server. Okay, let me go up here. Let's try and create this here and see if we can get some more info on this. New mobile service create. Geo demo X1. Drop it into East US next. So all the tooling that I'm showing you today in VS is actually, uh, it's sort of the preview bits. So did I select East US? There we go. So they're not 100% yet, but when we ship uh, VS 2013, the bits will be revved. Let's delete this guy. 
Now, while that creates, I'm just going to show you this app. So building this, it's not building, right? And the reason is, is that I've got a few like things in here where I'm referencing the namespace, but at the moment it's like completely disconnected. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to pull in the mobile services client SDK. One way to do that is through NuGet. Um, you could use the console or you can just find it online here, Windows Azure Mobile Services. And this basically drops in uh, the NuGet package, which is pre-baked into that quick start. So this is how you would essentially go and add this to your existing applications. There we go. Hit install. I always use the console, which is why I'm struggling with the, <laughs> the GUI here. OK, accept any licensing agreements. It's going to pull down uh, the mobile service client and the dependencies to that. Let's check in on this while it does that. Looks like we're having some bandwidth issues today, but that's all right. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to pre-create a table called place, and we'll use that in a little while. Geez, sort of slow downloading these. And I need a hand crank. Any any questions while we do this? Yep. Um, I, I can't say exactly y yes or no, but basically y it's, it's pretty obvious that the development experiences are slowly starting to converge between the two. So, you know, I, I, you can't say yes or no because features get pulled, you know, depending on timing. So you, you could assume that eventually it'll be there. <laughs> Does that give you a, a non-exclusive sort of answer? This is really slow, man. So these are just pulling down those libraries and dropping them into my project. Uh, hopefully it'll be done soon. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, three, four, five. Waiting on one more. <clears throat> I'm not a very good dancer. I'm good at karaoke, though, if you want to. Yes, question? Um, the big push that you need to do for the, for the yep. Can you push that to a staging environment? Well, OK, so in, with cloud services like Web and Worker Role, we've got the concept of staging and production, and you just VIP swap between them. At the moment, with mobile services, we don't have like staging and production slots. But you could you know, just as easily push it to another mobile service. So you could say peters-staging and just have two there, and then you know, test it on the staging version, and then push it up to the, the real version as needed. So that's done, uh, which is good. Let's hit uh, run here. So this is disconnected at the current point in time. So what we'd like to see is this thing running. So I built this sample, and it's available on windowsazure.com. So you can actually go along and follow this, these things step by step that we're doing here if you want to reproduce this. But the app's pretty simple. You've got this green thing that's you. You've got a radius of two kilometers. And since we don't know where we are, it's just at 0, 0 latitude, longitude. All right? So let's do the first thing of figuring out where are we. So to do that, we can use what's called the geolocator class. Um, I'll use a snippet here to speed it up. Now, the geolocator class is provided in Windows or WinRT API. If we go to definition here, you can see it's in Windows devices.geolocation. Now, this particular class is also available in Windows Phone in the same namespace for WinPhone 8. But what we do is we say, create an instance of that, say git geoposition async. I'm using this as a little sort of just a, a class representing my positions the way I want it. Um, the geo position type returned here has altitude and some other attributes hanging off it, which I don't really need. I just only need latitude and longitude. And I just say location, coordinate, point. This is new in 8.1. Before, it just used to be location dot coordinate dot latitude. Uh, we've gone and sort of pushed that into what we call point now so we can provide additional attributes in there. 
Um, so it cleans up the API a little bit. And in any case, that's a latitude and longitude. And then I just return that. And then I've got some code around this, which just goes and adds a push bin to the map. So with that, it should use the uh, IP address of my device here, because I don't have a GPS in my laptop, right? And it's used the IP address to figure out that that's, that's roughly where we are. And that's, that's pretty accurate. So you can see, so we're in the exhibition center. So that's good. So that's part one, where am I? Uh, the next part here is going to be, uh, how do I add a place or a point of interest? So within the app, I've already got a sort of dialogue that pops up when I click on it, so add a place. So we basically need to wire up the CRUD operation to insert that place. And that's, that's pretty easy to do as well. So let's jump over to my add a place uh, code behind. And here we're just going to say insert a place. We say app.mobile service, get table place, which is the table we created before in the portal. Um, I sh probably should have shown at that point that you can create a table directly here through Server Explorer as well and we insert the place. So a place has a title, description, a latitude, and longitude. This is not uh, resolving because I haven't defined uh, an instance of the mobile service client. So this is the client proxy you use to talk to your mobile service. So to do that, the easiest way is to come in and say, connect an existing Windows Store app, copy this code, drop that, and hit save. Saving, I think so. All right, so with that now, we should be able to add a place and have it persist up to the server. So there's one. And let's put one closest to us, there's two. But we're not actually plotting this at the moment. And that's because I really, like we, if you're doing it like neatly, you'd actually plot that rather than doing a round trip query to the server to get the places back. But I want to show you how you can perform a radial search and say, send back any locations that are within this blue circle here. Um, so let's do that. Those places are now on the server side. I'll show you that. Um, select data, drill into place. You'll see that it's scaffold the longitude, latitude, title, and description columns, and you can see that they're both there. So now that we have that, let's, uh, let's create that radial search. But there's one thing I want to do before that. The latitude and longitude here are stored in basically a double. Um, it's, it's reasonable for the data type, but if you want to make use of uh, SQL Server, we've got a spatial data type called geography, uh, which represents a spatial point. And that also has functions off it that you can execute to do things like, say, uh, get me everything within a distance of an origin. So what we're going to do, and the reason I like this demo is not just because it shows you spatial data, it shows you how to go outside of the standard box scenario of mobile services. We don't serialize, we don't look at the, your entity and say, oh, it's got a latitude and longitude, that must be a geography data type. We just see it as a number and it's a double, so we use that. So let me show you now how you can connect to your mobile service database backend and actually go off and execute SQL. And in this case, we're going to drop those two columns and we're going to create a geography. Uh, we're going to create a geography column called location to store that, which will make it easy for us to query back. Um, so I need to do one thing. If I want to connect from uh, my local machine up to my SQL server, this is the one I'm using, I need to actually go off and configure an IP rule to say that, hey, Nick's IP here in this conference center is allowed to connect to this SQL DB. By default, nothing's allowed to connect there. You can see that this server, I've done some stuff before, but this is my IP address. I'm just gonna do this, put in the whole range. Not really safe to do, you shouldn't really do that, but sometimes the originating IP changes on these uh, speaker networks. Probably want to call it something other than QWERTY U, <laughs> something that makes sense. But in any case, so now we've got that. So now we can connect to it in Management Studio. So this is my DB server. 
hit connect. And now we can connect, we can expand, we can see all my DBs on there. I think we call this demo X1. I've got a table and there's our place table. So I'm going to open a recent file that I've got here and we're going to call this is, what is it, geo demo x1 db. So we're going to delete everything in the place table. We're going to drop the latitude longitude table and add a geography column. Uh, invalid object name, did I spell it wrong? Geo demo x1, ah, uh, whoops. Geo demo x1. So this is the schema prefix. The schema prefix has the same name as your mobile service. That's the actual uh, DB there, which I'm connected to. So there we go. So that's done. It's deleted it and added that column. Now, if I go back to my client here, the, the logical question is, well, hold on, you're passing up a place that had a latitude and longitude how are you now going to have your mobile service convert that to a geography data type? And to do that, we can actually manipulate the insert script in our mobile service to go and transform that from doubles into a geography data type. And I've got a little bit of script here that we'll use to do that. Let's, uh, I opened the wrong one there. Let's refresh this guy. Close that one. Geodema X. Let's go to insert. And let's add some script and then we'll walk through what it does. Whoa. Place insert. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, here's a parameterized query, insert into place, title, description, and location. Values, parameters. And last, we say, let's create geography, st point from text says create a geography data type from text. This is a SQL function that exists um, and it takes two parameters, the longitude and latitude. So you can see I take the item longitude and item latitude and they're replaced directly in here when I execute this query. And we're using the MS SQL object to do that. On success, respond with status code OK. So if I hit save on this now, and then return back to my app, once that's done. Okay, good. Let me just restart it here. What we'll have, when I do this and hit add, it's gonna execute that script on the server side and store the data in the appropriate type. So let's look at that data now. Go off and say geodema x data, and now what we've got is our location column. You can see that it's now storing it as a spatial data type. So the last thing we want to do here is use what's called custom API. And this is going to provide our radial search. So I'm going to call this, uh, hmm, what should I call it? I want it to match my snippet. Uh, let me just check what that is. Da, 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 da places. Let me just check this. Query places. Okay, it's called place. Okay. So I'm going to call this custom API place. Anybody with the app key can execute on this. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to write basically a uh, or hook up to the get verb. And when we actually perform a HTTP GET against this API. We want it to return back the current location. So let's add the code for this. Actually, first, let's go here. I want to show you this. So to invoke this API, app.mobileService, invoke API async, where you are going to call place, get, and we've got a filter. Now my filter that I'm creating here is just basically key value pairs of my current longitude, my current latitude, and the radius or distance that I want to search around that point of origin. So with this code, it's going to call that API 
and the, the, the essential code that we need to execute here to query that using that new geography data type is going to be this. So you can see select ID, blah, so that's just our properties, where the location column distance is with, sorry, let me get this right, let me scroll across here. There we go. So we say, take the location that's stored in the DB, calculate the distance from that location to the location that's passed up, which is the point of origin, and where it's less than a radius. And when we call uh, custom API invoke, that filter that we're passing up, you can see the longitude goes in, the latitude goes in, and if this, uh, that's why the scroll's not working. And the last parameter there being the distance. So it's simply saying, calculate the distance between two points, location and origin, where that distance is less than the distance provided. So with that, that's all we really need to do to complete that scenario. So now our uh, app should be wired to not only just save points, but also to, uh, to return back places that are within a certain radius. Let me run this again. OK. Any questions so far? No? OK, so you can see there's one of the points come back. If I add another point here, just inside, you see that we've now got this point. But if I go and say, let's go a search radius of 1 km, you've actually now only got the one place returning. And the other one that was up here is now not returned. So that's called a radial search. So that's the end of the geo demo. What I really want you to take away from that is that you can get access to your data and you can manipulate your schema for scenarios that aren't supported in the dynamic schematization of mobile services. So in this case, we added support for the geography data type. And we also demonstrated custom API, which is one of the new features we re recently released uh, back at Build. I think we've got 15 minutes. Yeah, OK. Good. So let's, uh, let's look at a media scenario. So in this scenario, I basically want to show you how can I capture media in a Windows 8.1 app. You could use like the file dialog. In this case, we're going to use the camera. Um, so how do I capture that? But then how do I securely upload that to Windows Azure Blob Storage? So Windows Azure Blob Storage is basically a place you can shove binary data. Uh, you can restrict that such that you can't uh, access that. Uh, so there's permission sets available that you can set on that. But you can also publicly expose some of that data. But to write to Blob Storage, there's a couple ways of doing that. And what I'd like to show you here is uh, exactly how this workflow works. So let me do this here. Pen and we'll use white. So if you've got a client application here, we'll call it Win8 up, and you want to store something up in the cloud, you need to know how to do that. So we're going to say this is, let's just say this is blob storage. <laughs> I guess you guys can understand. You may need to be a little bit imaginative. This pen thing doesn't work too well. But so to store stuff in blob storage, there's a few ways to do it. You can use an app key. So that would mean uh, you have an account name. I should have cleaned my screen before doing this, and a key. Now, if you store these account names and keys on a device, and you're using that to write your files to storage, there's a problem with that. And that's if someone goes and reverse engineers your application, they can take those keys, and then they've basically got the key set that you know, allows them to go and store up to uh, 200 terabytes of data on your account, which you're going to pay for. So don't do this, OK? What this point of this is going to be is showing you the right way to do this. Um, so let's, where's my eraser? Let's move this out. OK, so let's uh, put that back and say, so we've got our Win8 up. The second way that people may think to do this is, uh, OK, 
let me put up a web server here and have my blob storage over here still and store the uh, account name and key on the server side. Let's say the user auths in the app and writes to this and then this web, like web API, mobile service, whatever, proxies the write of that file up to the server. That's a valid way of doing it, but it's still not the most efficient. Um, the issue you have with this scenario is if you're sending one meg files up and you're sending a lot of them up, what will happen is your web tier essentially is, you know, you, you've got a certain I.O. throughput that a single instance can have. Like any con connected device can only have so much bandwidth, right? So what would happen here is if you're sending one meg of each files and you've got a lot of users, you're going to have to scale out your web tier sort of to support those multiple files coming up when you start sort of getting capped uh, by bandwidth. But that's got a cost associated to it, right? Every one of these costs money. So what we can do is we can use what is probably the best practice. And what it's called is it's called a blob SaaS. So a blob SaaS is like a time box token. It's just a simple query string that's generated on the server side and basically gives anyone with that query string access to a resource for a period of time. And you can say, you know, this uh, SaaS, shared access signature, is valid for five minutes. It's valid for 30 seconds, it's valid for an hour, it's valid for days, whatever you want. And you can generate these on the server side and you do need the account name and account key. And this is sort of what the scenario looks like. You have the account name and key there, so that's still the same. Rather than sending a file up, you have your user authenticate, they hit your service, and the service generates a SAS. So you get this SAS back. I'll put a question so it looks like a query string. Then using that SAS, you can take your photo, you can actually then upload using the SAS directly to the storage service. Now the Windows Azure storage service allows you to basically be pushing data up at up to 60 mega second. And by doing that, really you're just like moving that data um, or that throughput off your web tier. Your web tier is returning back a simple query string and you're offloading like that, in that case, that three megs of three separate files to the blob service. Ingress into blob storage, so anything you upload costs you nothing. The cost is for the retention of the data um, and egress if you're downloading the data. So this is significantly cheaper than scaling out your web tier because you're basically pushing your files up directly to the blob service and any inbound traffic is free to blob storage. So that will save you quite a, quite a lot of money. Um, so let's, let's build this. Oh, don't want to show my calendar to everyone. <laughs> um, so let's uh, open, how do I I'm still keep, we want to keep that, okay. So let's open a solution that I've sort of set up a little bit. It's called media, hit okay. Now this is a, a pretty, it's not as pretty as the last one. I didn't have time to make the UI look nice. But basically I have a, uh, a button and a list view that binds to images. And we're gonna write all the code to implement this entire scenario. Um, so the first thing we need is, let's uh, try and create a media service here. Media demo X. And we're going to drop it into East. Actually, you know what? Let's just use this same service. I'm just gonna reuse this service to save us a little bit of time. Um, so we'll just add a table here called media. Hit create. And that's going to store basically the link and the file name to blob storage after we upload it. So let's, let's do uh, the first step here. The first step would be to take a photo, right? So let's come in and we can say, uh, let's capture an image. Camera capture UI. Camera is equal to new. Now this is a class available within the API as well. And then we can say camera dot photo settings, let's say cropped aspect ratio. We're going to use this later on. I think it's size and we're gonna say 310 by 150. We'll use this for a tile later on. 
excuse me, and now we can say var image is equal to await camera dot capture file async. The capture UI mode allows you to say whether you want photo, video, or both. We're just going to do photo for this one. Save. Now that will take our photo. But now what we need is we actually need that blob SAS, right? So we can upload it. So what I'm going to do here, you could use a custom API like we did with the read script that generates a SAS when you authenticate. Um, in actual fact, this scenario, we should add authentication so not anyone can just get a SAS right or anyone without the key. That aside, what we're going to do is we're going to insert basically a placeholder for this image. And on the insert script, we're going to generate a blob SAS and send that back down to the client such that the client can then go and write up to the server. And I've got some uh, snippets here. Uh, we will say get table. Let me, uh, let me take this. I'm just going to drop in the big, big snippet because we're running up against a wall here pretty fast. OK, so this is the same. Do that. If the image isn't null, this is my DTO for the media table. You can see that it's here. I've got a container name. That's like a folder you could consider, a file name, a SAS, and a URL. Now, when I new this guy up, what's happening is I'm only setting the container and file name. Those other properties, the SAS, etc., and the URL are not set. So my insert script is actually going to update these, and that SAS will then be returned to the client after performing an insert. So you can see await app. This time it expects it to be called SAS demo client get table media, insert async, and send up this guy. So let's, let's get that piece working. So you can see we're missing something here. One of the cool new features we added uh, in 2013 is this concept of saying add connected service. You can see this isn't actually resolving. When I say add connected service, we've created a new dialog here that allows you to choose an existing mobile service or to create a new one. So once this is uh, refreshed here, we can say we're using geo demo still. Select this guy, hit OK. And now if I drop over into my app code behind, you can see that we've created a mobile service client instance with the appropriate keys. So give that the right name, and build. Now this is inserting that media, but we want to uh, basically set or generate a SAS on the server side. So to do that, we just expand media, we'll go to the insert script here, and then we'll drop in a snippet, which is WAMS insert media. So I'm using an Azure module here. And if you look here, we've got our insert operation. I've got my account name and key now safely on the server side. Um, and what we do now is we say the host, this is blob storage. So cloudnick.blob.core.windows.net is our storage account. You'll see it pop up here in a second. And what I want to do is I want to create a container and put the image within that container. Um, this is my wrong storage account, uh, wrong subscription. That's interesting. Um, in any, uh, let's add it here. Let me, sorry, bear with me. So this key, which now is on the live recording, I will change that before anyone <laughs> takes my keys. So I'm just going to attach this storage account. You can see there's blobs there. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that, we figure out what container we want it to go into, and then we're using the Azure module to say, get a handle to the blob service client, create the container if it doesn't exist. We want people to publicly read them, but you need a SAS to write there. And then we say, if there's no error creating it, let's set that shared access policy, which says this SAS is valid for 30 minutes, and the user can write to that container for 30 minutes from now. After that, it'll become invalid. I say item.sas, so now I'm setting the items property, sas property, is equal to get blob URL. This generates the sas for that policy. And then I'm also storing the actual URL of where that image will be. So if I save this now, we're almost done. So this then, media will be updated when it returns from the server. Let me set a breakpoint there. And then from that, I can use the uh, storage client SDK for Windows 8. 
to go off and take a file stream from that image and strip or take the SAS URI from the media, create a credential using the SAS query string, and then basically create the container, get a block reference, and then upload the file. So only a few lines of code, but this is the, the basically the most secure way to do it. The only thing I'd add here is to have the users authenticate against a service before being able to you know, perform an insert, rather than having an embedded mobile service key here, which someone could get at. But uh, that's, that sort of ties into the auth demo. With that, let's, uh, let's run this guy. Does anyone want to be a, a, an assistant to get their photo taken? No? Yes? Come on. So, uh, we, we're going to take a photo of you. Uh, come up here. Just watch, watch your step. OK. There you go. You've got you to gotta do something, something funny. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> OK. What? Let's retake it. Okay. okay. There we go. There you go. <laughs> so there's the aspect ratio that we talked about, thank you, before. Hit OK. Now, this will hit my breakpoint. So it's now performing the insert, but it's not uploading the image. But what we've got back now is that SAS. You can see it's a big, long query string. And now, using that, we just go off and directly upload to our storage account. So that'll take a few seconds to finish, and there you go. That's the image actually pulled down live from Blob Storage. So as you recall, when we created the container, we made the container public for read. So if I go down here into the container's called media, and sort by date, if we copy the URL of this, you can see that it's now a publicly addressable image. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty cool, safe way to do things. Okay, so we've only got uh, a couple minutes left. What I'd really like to show you guys is uh, we, we probably can't do periodic notifications, uh, but we can certainly, sorry, we can certainly do, um, we can certainly do uh, the new push notification wizard. So for those of you who are in the session today, it took like 15 minutes to configure push notifications without 2012 tooling. To configure push now is really quite straightforward. I'm going to add a new project here, create a new app. There we go. And let's, uh, let's use a service. We'll call this, uh, we'll, use, we'll use Peter. So to add push notifications now, add push notification. Hit next. Similar to before, we actually associate our app with a store. Hit sign in. Now we choose a store app to associate it with. This is part of the publishing and packaging uh, bits for Windows. We're going to associate with Foobler. Hit next. We choose our mobile service that we want to configure for push. And we're going to use Peter. Hit next, hit finish, and uh, with that, it's going off and getting all the, basically, the credentials required for the client, credentials required for the server, configuring our mobile service, um, dropping in a little bit of sample code, that will send us a push notification. And basically, it, it took like two minutes to click through that as opposed to, I don't know, how long was it today in the first session? <coughs> 15 minutes or so? And there, there we have it. So it's, it's really quite, uh, quite a powerful tooling enhancement. So if I execute this now, what we'll see is we'll actually get, up in the top right here in a second hopefully, a toast. What do you think? Pretty cool? It's really cool when you've had to do that manually before. So, all right. So that's, uh, that's a push notification workflow. Uh, let's stop this guy, I'll show you the code, and then we'll stop there. So what it's done is on the client, it's configured the client and server for us. And if we drill into this here, you can see services, mobile services, Peter, it's dropped in this push register. And this essentially grabs your channel and goes and inserts it into a channels table. If we expand Peter here, it'll have added a channels table. On top of that, 
uh, what it's done is it's added an insert script to the to-do item, oh, sorry, an insert script, my bad, to the uh, channels table such that when you save that channel, it's just looping back and sending you that toast notification. So it's an end-to-end -end working demonstration of how to send notifications, and it's, it's a great piece of, of tooling. It'll save you a lot of time. So uh, with that, I think we should close. Uh, periodic notifications, just so you're aware, they're essentially a means by which you can have your client poll the server for a tiled template. And that polling means, basically, that you don't have a, a somewhat complicated workflow with all this authorization, server scripts, and such. You can just return back valid XML, and it will go off and, uh, and, and update your tiles. Uh, if anyone's interested, we can go through that uh, after. So with that, thanks for coming. Uh, we did getting started source control NPM support. We sort of went past auth the standard scenario and showed you how to cache credentials. We added, uh, built a geolocation app, used custom API, which is a really cool new feature. We manipulated our schema of our DB, um, which is something that you do need to do with most sort of real world applications. Uh, we securely uploaded media to storage and you know, made that publicly then uh, downloadable. And we sort of added push notifications in a couple of minutes. So thanks for coming and a round of applause for my beautiful assistant. <laughs>